Getting off on Titan is a breeze. I'm telling myself that all the time these days, and I'm hearing it a lot from NASA engineers too, all cozy in their chairs. But they are right. Venus, yes, it really is hell, but Saturn's big moon, no. Titan's atmosphere is also unbreathable, but at ground level, the pressure is only a little higher than on Earth. It doesn't crush you like Venus, which is 95 times heavier. Also, Titan doesn't try to fuse the lander you're down with or your suit with sulfuric acid puffs. Neither does it have winds that blow like those of Jupiter, nor temperatures that threaten to liquid you and your entire spacecraft. On Titan, it's cold, it's true, but minus 195 degrees Celsius, I don't know why, sounds better than plus 450 degrees Celsius. It gives me more confidence, it seems more human. Let's say rather that Titan is much more out of the way than Venus to get there, and it's only thanks to a revolutionary direct fusion engine that we're about to complete the Earth-Saturn crossing in less than two years. And it has been 41 years since, with the Huygens probe, we had the last direct contact with Titan. Unfortunately, the Dragonfly mission of 2035 ended in disaster, and it is only today, February 23, 2046, aboard the James Clerk Maxwell, a spacecraft with nuclear propulsion for the first time, that we are going back again. Tomorrow afternoon, Earth time, in fact, the Maxwell will land near Antilla Faculae, the marshy archipelago where Huygens landed on January 14, 2005. If all goes well, there will be three of us descending to the surface. But the funny thing is that I will already be there waiting for my companions. Can you believe it? Here's what I'm going to do. While we're still orbiting Titan, I'm going to put on a suit made for the occasion. I'm going to go out on the balcony set up for extravehicular activities, and from there, at the right time, I'm going to let myself go into freefall. It won't be the madness of a moment, but a mission plan before departure. I will slow down my speed through jets of nitrogen emitted by the thrusters of my suit, and then all I have to do is fall towards the surface, telling the radio everything I see, everything that my senses and my instruments will collect. What do you want to do? Come along? A dive into Titan's atmosphere to find the old Huygens probe. If you are here watching this video, it means you are passionately curious about human spaceflight and the mysteries of the universe. We constantly strive to make videos that excite a curious person like you, so subscribe now and be sure to press the bell notification so you never miss out on the updates about the cosmos. Today, we know that somehow Titan is a world similar to ours. Certainly not because of the climate or the breathability of the air. Titan is in fact about a billion and a half kilometers from the Sun. So it receives just 19th of the light that our planet receives, and its atmosphere is made mostly of nitrogen with a little methane. Certainly Titan is a complex world, unlike Mars, for example, has a very dense atmosphere reminiscent of that of Earth several billion years ago. Its surface, moreover, has been modeled by phenomena that appear quite similar to those in action here on Earth, such as soil erosion by winds and fluids. On Earth, it is obviously water, liquid or solid. A fluid capable of modifying the landscape, while on Titan it is likely that methane plays this role. The average temperature of the large moon of Saturn is minus 182 degrees Celsius, very close to that of the so-called triple point of methane of minus 180 degrees Celsius. Therefore, small climate changes are sufficient to allow the presence of gaseous methane in the atmosphere and liquid or frozen methane on the surface. And this makes possible a hydrological cycle of methane similar to that of water on Earth. But the similarity with Earth is only apparent. Titan is, in fact, a totally alien world and, as far as we know, also very different from the other solid bodies of the solar system. Instead of liquid water, Titan has liquid methane. Instead of silicate rocks, Titan has rocks of compact ice. Instead of dust, Titan has a regolith made of ice and carbon compounds. Instead of lava flows, Titan has volcanoes that erupt ice. A very strange world, which reveals its secrets only with great difficulty. However, everything we know, or almost, of this remote world we owe to the Cassini-Huygens mission. If you remember, Cassini took Huygens with it for seven long years, then upon reaching the Saturn system, dropped it on Titan, kind of what Maxwell will do with me tomorrow, and then continued its grand tour until 2017. During its parachuted descent, Huygens collected data for two hours and 28 minutes, and after landing, continued to transmit for another 72 minutes. Tomorrow, God willing, I will go and try to wake it up. February 24th, 2046, T plus zero. I have just detached myself from the handrail of the gallery. 
The microcomputer that governs all of my movements immediately activates the thrusters to decrease my speed and above all to draw the trajectory that should bring me down very close to the position where Huygens is right now. I am consoled by the fact that once upon a time the eclipses of uncertainty in a landing measured tens of kilometers, while today we are able to reduce them to 100 meters, at least in theory. Yeah, but where did Huygens really land? It may sound bizarre, but it wasn't easy to figure out. The problem is that Titan is covered by a very opaque fog. In fact, the images Huygens took as it descended are the only ones we have of the surface in the visible. To figure out where the exact location was, yesterday we had to hit the approximate region located west of Shangri-La with a radar beam. And now that we know the exact coordinates with the approximation of one meter, it is up to my computer to calculate everything well and bring me to my destination. T plus five minutes. I'm still in free fall at an altitude of 90 kilometers. At this altitude, the atmospheric pressure is one hundredth of the Earth's, practically the same as on Mars. On my visor, all the data from the sensors are aligned. The temperature is 130 degrees Celsius. And this very light haze that surrounds me apparently is made of tholins, a kind of aerosol that is formed by the irradiation of methane by ultraviolet radiation from the sun, often combined with inorganic substances such as molecular nitrogen. The presence of tholins on Titan is intriguing because they are thought to contain some of the chemical precursors of life. However, I passed through it at more than 110 km per hour and after a few minutes at 80 km altitude, I plunged into the densest layer of tholins, the one that when seen from the outside totally dulls the view of Titan's surface. Meanwhile, the thrusters slowed me down to a speed of 32 km per hour. T plus 12 minutes. The computer commands the opening of the parachute and from this moment the descent becomes slower and slower. Visibility is much more reduced than before. I am descending through orange gas clouds, but I can still see the sun above me. No trace instead of the surface looking down. The atmospheric pressure tripled compared to before and the temperature dropped to minus 170 degrees Celsius. The shift due to the wind is getting stronger and stronger, and I pray with all my strength that the computer will take this into account. T plus 56 minutes. At an altitude of 60 kilometers, I suddenly emerged from the layer of dense mist. I almost fainted from the surprise. I see the surface of Titan and I am the first human being to do so. I see among some clouds branched channels carved by liquid that perhaps flowed in times not far away. Now they seem empty, but at the bottom there is perhaps organic material, hydrocarbon deposits. The jagged outlines of seas and lakes become clearer. I descend through what the viewer tells me is a fog of hydrocarbons. The temperature has reached minus 200 degrees Celsius, which should be the minimum measurable on Titan. From here on, it should start to rise again. T plus 1 hour 21 minutes. I am at 30 kilometers. Some turbulence is starting to be felt. The wind thrust is discontinuous. I have reached an altitude where large white clouds composed of methane and molecular nitrogen are hovering. I look down and try to understand if the computer is pushing me in the right direction, towards Shangri-La. I still can't get my bearings. T plus 2 hours 11 minutes. At an altitude of 20 kilometers, I suddenly find myself in the middle of a thunderstorm with violent bursts of rain. NASA scientists had told me that on Titan it very rarely rains at low altitudes, and here I am on the vertical of the equator, but that when it rains it pours. And in fact, I'm having a very bad time, with strong winds and continuous electrical discharges between clouds. The worry does not prevent me from noticing that the methane droplets are very large up to a couple of centimeters in diameter and due to gravity which on Titan is only one-seventh of Earth's, also very slow. Much slower than me, so much so that I am the only one raining down on them, slow as snowflakes. It is these rains that form the methane lakes, at least at higher latitudes, where it rains more frequently. All around the sky is stormy and dark, but underneath I see plains sprinkled with dunes that stretch for dozens and dozens of kilometers, probably formed by the tholines that descend from the upper atmosphere and then are deposited on the surface. The fact is that on Titan, again due to the reduced gravity, lower than that of our moon, the deposits can be as high as 100 meters. Hills and sand dunes are then carved by branched channels and canyons. T plus 3 hours 1 minute. At an altitude of 10 kilometers, I emerge from the storm and finally manage to see and recognize the dark spot of Shangri-La. A little further west is the jagged coastline of Antilla Faculae, where Huygens had been waiting for me for 41 years. 
At this altitude, the air pressure is exactly the same as on Earth, while the temperature has risen to minus 190 degrees Celsius. Towards the east, I can see a column of gas rising from the horizon, a plume that bends sharply northwards higher up. I don't want to be wrong, but I have the almost absolute certainty that it is an erupting volcano. I feel like I am dreaming. It could be the confirmation of the existence of volcanism on Titan, which would explain the origin of methane. With enthusiasm sky high, I prepare to touch down. T plus 3 hours 59 minutes. After almost 4 hours of descent, I touch down with the lightness of a feather, slowed down to a crawl by the thrusters that are almost empty. I immediately activate the release of the plate that binds me to the parachute to prevent the wind from dragging me away, a wind that does not exceed 17 km per hour. I look around me, incredulous. The landscape is disturbing, silent and cold. A flat landscape, a ground with the consistency of wet sand sprinkled with smooth stones. I hold one in my hand and it feels as compact and heavy as real rock and not made of ice as someone thought. But I don't have much time. I ask the computer to calculate the distance between me and the Huygens and I don't like the answer. 277 meters. Luckily, the terrain is flat until the horizon, apparently without obstacles. I set off and in the meantime, I make sure Maxwell has detected my position. The daytime sky has a decidedly dark orange color and appears uniform in all directions due to the significant scattering of the high altitude haze layers. The sun should be very high, but instead it is not visible. The light is that of a cloudy, gloomy terrestrial sunset, absolutely invisible Saturn which should appear gigantic and looming on the eastern horizon. T plus 4 hours 27 minutes. I'm out of breath from the effort. It was not easy to walk in this suit and with this gravity, but I finally managed to reach the site indicated by the computer. The problem is that I don't see the pro. Huygens is a kind of cylinder 130 centimeters wide and 80 centimeters high, so it should be clearly visible, but nothing. So I try to look for it by moving away on an increasingly wide spiral, but the only result is to realize that my boots get heavier and heavier, collecting a sticky slush. There must be liquid methane flowing down there, I tell myself, and maybe in all these years, the probe has been carried further downstream by the movements of the ground. And indeed, there it is, about 30 meters to the south, practically buried. Only the radio antenna still sticks out from the surface. I kneel down and remove the rocks and mud covering the top. Then I stay there, and I'm not ashamed to say that for the first time since the beginning of my descent, I no longer feel alone and abandoned to myself. We stand there together, Huygens and I, waiting for Maxwell to come and get us and bring us home at last.